Hey, this is Digital by Computing. Today we're gonna to be talking about the IT acceptable use policy. We're gonna be talking about what it is and what it should contain and why you need one in the place that you work. So my name is Emilio and I work in the IT industry and I absolutely love it. And today we're talking about the acceptable use policy, the AUP. Uh, we're gonna be covering essentially what it is and why you need to have one. Essentially, it's an overview of acceptable use for the IT systems. Everything that is technology related in an organization is primarily to be used for business purposes. The acceptable use policy outlines to the business and to the business users what the IT system's primary use should be. You need to outline details for hardware. For systems, for hardware, this includes laptops, desktops, tablets, phones, uh, servers, and any other sort of hardware that is used by staff, including IT staff in an organization. What they can and can't do, even things like USB sticks, are USB sticks allowed in an organization? So really all of the hardware in an organization is owned by that business. So if you have a desktop or a laptop that is allocated, that has been given to a staff member uh, for use within that company, if they've been provided a mobile phone, a tablet, a monitor, USB sticks, whatever it may be, that is owned, that is the property of that organization. So that organization has the right to be able to say to staff what they can and cannot do on that computer. That computer is not the staff member's computer. It's not like your home PC, your home laptop, where you can do whatever you want on it. You can play games, you can surf the you know YouTube machine, you can do all this sort of stuff. While at work, you may not have that same privilege. So the staff members are bound by what the organization states you can and cannot do with your computer systems, with your hardware. Hardware can also include the pieces of infrastructure, the setups of video conferencing, projectors, things like that, that are spread across meeting rooms, uh, conference rooms, boardrooms, things like that, and shouldn't be used for purposes that the business does not allow it to be used for. Another piece of hardware that needs to be included is the use of phones. You may be provided a desk phone, uh, and what can you do with that desk phone? Can you use that desk phone for personal use or not? Should it be only used for business? Can you make calls domestic, internationally? If your phone system is using some sort of a VoIP service, you could have tracking, logging, recording of calls. So including a section that informs staff that their phone calls are monitored, that their phone calls are recorded is also important. If staff are provided a mobile phone, even if staff are reimbursed their personal mobile phone within the organization hours, let's say a nine to five hour window, what staff can and can't do with their mobile phone. We don't want staff being on their phone all day, playing games on their phone all day, um, and that needs to be outlined in that policy. A section detailing the Wi-Fi uh, setup and connectivity in the, uh, in the building, in the office, in the organization is also helpful. Uh, there could be multiple Wi-Fi hotspots, multiple Wi-Fi adapters around the place, some connecting to the corporate network where you use your AD credentials, your username and your password, which obviously expires, and then other hotspots that are perhaps guest networks that staff can use for internet only, external guests coming in, contractors, consultants, things like that, that do not need to have access into the corporate network can still connect by a guest network. So ensuring that they're listed and there's a detail around what each of the Wi-Fi networks do and provide. As well as your internal Wi-Fi in a building, uh, given that a lot of staff are now working remotely, ensuring that staff Wi-Fi networks at home are also secure. This could be encouraging staff or actually enforcing to staff that their Wi-Fi passwords must be complex at home, that they must have a secure environment from working remotely. Because the last thing you wanna happen is for staff to be uh, intercepted at home, for somebody to get into their network at home because of poor security, that then leads into your uh, computer that is actually a company-owned piece of hardware. Most companies nowadays do use a VPN connection, which is a virtual private network, essentially creating a, de a dedicated connection from your home to your work environment 
and outlining what the requirements are, how it's connected, whether you're using your AD credentials again, and letting staff know that when they're on the VPN network, that it's as if they're working from within the office. They essentially have full connectivity into the network if they're working remotely via a VPN connection. The software and the data that resides on these computers is again property of the organization of the business. Some of the data, some of the business data that you may be working on that others in the organization are working on are considered what's called intellectual property that is owned by that business. So that business has the right to be able to say what you can and can't do with that software, with that data. Perhaps that data cannot be taken off site. Data, software, hardware, is to be used based on what the organization allows and doesn't allow. That doesn't mean that computers cannot be used for personal use, but that is dictated again by the acceptable use policy. There also needs to be considerations around data that is sitting up in the cloud, whether this be on a, you know, perhaps on Microsoft 365 uh, or some other sort of cloud service Dropbox or whatever it may be. The policy needs to outline steps around that because that data also belongs to the organization. So the policy should also include what staff can and can't do with data that is residing in the cloud. Everyone uses email and in a business, you're gonna be given an email account uh, and what can you and can't you do with that email account. Now again, this is very, very different depending on the company that you work for, but generally the business email address should be used for business purposes and not personal. If personal is allowed, it is generally kept to a minimum. The email system is owned by the business. The emails that go out are representing the business. Does the email contain inappropriate content or inappropriate material? That all needs to be outlined. Does the email allow certain attachment types or not? Things like the template, the format, the signature, how the email is structured, some organizations need to have all their emails looking a certain way using a particular template, a style guide, this font, this color, this size. The email signature needs to be in a particular format, perhaps just with the name, with the title, some other information, contact information, a little disclaimer down the bottom, something that is more standardized. That way everybody who is using the email systems knows that this is the way that our emails are formatted. Perhaps a little section that talks about uh, phishing, malware, suspicious emails, things like that, to let staff know, to be aware of things like that. If there are any concerns over an email that is received, informing the correct people, somebody in the IT department, uh, deleting that email, whatever it may be, quarantining that email, at least a section that outlines what these sort of uh, phishing techniques are, and then what the response should be if a staff member does receive an email. Also including a section that lets staff know that each computer has monitoring and protection software installed onto it. So this could be various forms. If you have some sort of a, uh, a malware protection, antivirus protection, is letting staff know that that is installed onto their computer. So if there is data that is residing on that computer that contains something that is malicious or a vulnerability or whatever, that that software will go ahead and clear it, quarantine it. If they get warnings up on their screen to let the staff member know that they should then go and inform that to the IT department. Further to that, letting staff know that various pieces of infrastructure around the organization are being monitored, that you have monitoring against certain core services to let people know if things go down, if things are working poorly, if there is software, for example, that is installed into a computer that shouldn't be installed into a computer, there are monitoring and services in place to let certain people, including the IT department, know so that they can then go and investigate further. Informing staff that their data is backed up if it's saved onto servers, if they have data that is saved onto their local PC and you don't have any sort of backups for local computers, local laptops and desktops, that that data is not backed up. So this is an encouragement for staff to work off servers if they can, because that data is secure, is backed up. At the end of the day, the company needs to protect themselves. They can't have staff doing whatever they want on their systems. Remembering that that data, that software, that hardware is owned by the business, right? Let's say, give you an example of somebody that's say in the sales department, they're a salesperson, they're working with sales documents, they're going out, they're going and trying to get leads here and there, they're winning deals. So the data that is residing on their computer can be quite sensitive because it contains information about prospects, sales, 
and products that they may want to acquire or products that they may want to sell, whatever it may be. Let's say they, they, they get poached from somebody else that really likes them. Um, what's gonna happen with all that data? Can that data live on their USB sticks? What if they took the USB sticks with them? What if that data was uploaded to a cloud server or emailed it to themselves or whatever it may be? So there needs to be adequate protection and an understanding for that data. Generally, an acceptable use policy is a document that outlines everything that a staff member can and can't do on a computer system or computer systems. Uh, this could be part of an induction process. So when a new staff member comes into an organization, they have to uh, you know, read all this information and then at the end sign to say they've accepted it um, and they're good to go. Uh, that could also include the acceptable use policy where the staff member has to review the, the rules that, that that organization outlines. And then once they've signed it, if that user decides to leave the organization or breach one of the outlined things that are stated in the acceptable use policy, you then can then go and have that discussion or you know, take it further uh, if you need to. Without this policy, you really don't have any control of what staff can and can't do. So this is true of a staff member who comes and says, look, I wanna use Facebook for eight hours a day. Uh, you as an organization needs to be able to say, well, no, you can't do that because in the acceptable use policy, it states that this is what you can do and what you can't do. So just to wrap up, just a real summary then, is the IT acceptable use policy really just outlines to staff the acceptable use of the IT systems from a hardware software perspective for email usage, for VPN, for Wi-Fi, and several other areas. But that's it for now. Again, there's a lot more that we can talk about. We just really skimmed the surface, but it's definitely a policy, a document that you really should use. Uh, it could be a pool of documents, but ensuring that you do have something in place and that it is uh, endorsed and signed off by the business and by even by director level uh, is something that is very, very important. I would love it if you commented below. Let me know your thoughts. Even if you have further questions, that would be great that we can have that dialogue. And also like this video, subscribe to Digital Byte Computing and click on that notification bell to be up to date as I release new videos because it helps me and it helps you to know when I release new content. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.